Okay. I'll say All right. Hi, my name is Pamela Ian. I'm a 17-year resident of Concord, a former police officer, and I am speaking on behalf of the group No More Bearcats. I have in my possession petitions signed by Concord residents who oppose the move to purchase a Bearcat by the City of Concord. The number of signatures collected thus far is the result of one day's effort over a period of four hours, and the effort will be ongoing, so it's not too late for your voice to be heard. The federal government is in $17 trillion worth of debt. This debt has been accumulating for quite some time, and no one political party is to blame. The blame rests squarely on irresponsible fiscal policies. With this astronomical debt, the federal government should be seeking ways to cut spending instead of increasing the debt and adding to our economic collapse. Instead of making prudent fiscal decisions, the government continues to offer money it does not have for various programs in the form of grants. The acquisition of the Bearcat is one such example. There is no such thing as free money from the federal government. The money either comes from raising taxes on other individuals or by printing more money, which leads to inflation and which in itself is an additional tax. Not enough people are listening in Washington, D.C. Since the federal government refuses to show any restraint, it is up to us to stop the bleeding. We can do this by making sure our local governments conduct themselves in a fiscally responsible way. It is important for people to put pressure on their local officials since the local level is where citizens have the most impact and can be heard. We should all be working to get the message out that it matters what we do at the local level. It is a false argument for our city councilors to pass the responsibility for this decision upon the federal government. The federal government will continue to spend money it does not have in this way as long as our local governments allow them to do so. The buck must stop here in Concord. We believe that other communities across New Hampshire and the country will follow our lead if the city, Concord City Council does the right thing by rejecting this money. Concord's chief of police has asked the school board to weigh in on the purchase of the Bearcat. We are encouraging parents and voting age students in our city to have their say about whether the city council should put over a quarter of a million dollars of debt upon the nation's already staggering economic burden. Concord does not need this ballistic engineered armored counterattack truck. The city already has access to armored vehicles at the New Hampshire State Police Barracks and at the National Guard Armory. For more information on this issue and a place for city residents to sign the petition online, please go to www.nomorebearcats.com. Several other people would like to speak, and after that we will entertain any questions. Thank you. I would next like to introduce State Senator Andy Sanborn, who is also a business owner here in Concord. Everyone, good afternoon. Thanks so much for coming here. I'm Andy Sanborn. I'm one of our state senators. I happen to be a Concord business owner and taxpayer. You know, I love Concord, and it's a great community. And frankly, our boys and girls in blue do a great job. But the question is, what type of a job do we want them to do? You know, this is a community. Someone has a sign that says, more Mayberry left. Illusion. I stutter, it comes out hard. You know, do we really need armored military weapons for the police to do their job? If they really need more support, maybe we need to talk about better training or more bulletproof vests. Because if it's a Bearcat today, is it going to be a peacekeeper tomorrow and then it's going to be nuclear weapons? I mean, what does a small community of 40,000 people need in order to make sure our citizens are protected? We don't have a lot of crime in this town. This is a town that comes together and manages it its own. And this is a perfect case where the, the, the city council really ought to focus its effort on making sure we remain a community and not a military zone. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Senator. I would next like to introduce Brian Blackton, 
Concord resident and business owner who will speak from his experience as a police officer. My name is Brian Blackton. I live and operate a business in Concord and interestingly, I sell self-defense products and own a firearm store. Insofar as Chief Duvall claiming he needs protection from 50 caliber rounds, let me tell you, it takes between four and $12,000 to buy the rifle to shoot one 50 caliber round, which happens to be this big. It is deemed an anti-aircraft round and is used for sniper use in the military up to one and a half to two miles. Chief Duval is actually doing the citizenry a disservice by arguing the Bearcat as a way to protect his officers and the citizenry. The chief would have you believe his officers are unprotected from firearms. That is one of the truthful, albeit misleading things he has said. The average police officer wears a level 3A bulletproof vest, which essentially protects them up to a 44 Magnum round or a 12 gauge shotgun round, and this is one of the inserts from the vest that they would wear. It is not until officers get into level three or level four armor piercing body armor that they are protected from rifle rounds that can be found in any home across the state of New Hampshire in any hunter's home. In 1997, Carl Draga fired upon police officers and civilians, leaving in his trail a wake of death. He didn't use this 50 caliber round. He used a very, very small 223 round. The same size round we ask our military to protect themselves with every day overseas. As a matter of fact, the average 3A bulletproof vest does not protect your officer on the street. This is why Chief Duval wants the Bearcat, because it is unsafe for any of his officers to engage anyone when they hear rifle rounds going off. He has not given them the proper, proper level of protection they need to engage the bad guys who have rifles. He wants them to retreat and wait for the big old Bearcat. I would just hope that when the officers jump out of the Bearcat, they have level four body armor on, or they are gonna be just as dead as anyone outside the Bearcat. If we spent the same 258 plus thousand dollars for level four armor, we could outfit and hopefully protect up to 50 police officers, not just the six to eight riding inside an armored Bearcat. We already have one of those on Hazen Drive at the State Police. You will hear people saying the Bearcat can drive into a school because the doors are big enough. What you need in a school shooting situation is level four body armor and shields that stop an assailant, not a Bearcat. You will need to be much more mobile inside a school than a vehicle Bearcat situation. Chief Duval stated in his application to the DHS that, it, that to be a DHS Type 2 tactical team, they have to have a Bearcat. That's why he wants one. I suggest we say no for numerous reasons. One, the state police already has one in the city. Manchester has one 20 minutes south instead of Belknap County's response that took over three hours. We have Nashua 40 minutes away. The chief has not made his line officers safe yet. He asks for DHS approval for a Bearcat. He would not take the money from his own police budget as he stated at the city council meeting. He could if he had set the funding aside each year like we do in capital purchases for fire trucks and police cruises and so forth. That has not been done. Note that the chief said he would not take it out of his budget, but he wants to increase the federal deficit with new spending, not surplus military equipment. I say, let the message be loud and clear from this time and place, here in Concord, New Hampshire. Save our country from financial demise. Make this the shot heard around the world. Woo! No more Bearcats. Yeah! Thank you, Mr. Blackton. Next up is Paula Garrick. From, she's president of the Free State Project, and she's going to speak about the language Chief Duval used in the grant application. I'm going to come nice and close to the mic. <laughs> um, so my name is Carla Garrick and I'm the president of the Free State Project. I'm the president of an organization that Chief Duvall called 
a domestic terrorist organization. I would like to state for the record that when I'm done here, I will be walking half a block over there to the Concord Public Library where I volunteered for the past four years to bring Concord Reads to the people. I take deep personal offense, as do most of the 14,600 plus participants of the Free State Project, to be used in a fraudulent, lying document to justify a Bearcat attack vehicle on the streets of a very peaceful, very wonderful place. We as free staters chose to come chose to come to New Hampshire. We chose to come here because we think it is probably the best place that you can be in America now if you actually believe in the principles that this country was based on. You cannot say to us that because we have ideas that are slightly different to yours that we are domestic terrorists. I would like to place this in crystal clear context for you. Peaceful people who are for small government are being politically targeted and politically profiled by local police to get their funds from the federal government, the big government, and that is against New Hampshire values. Government is purportedly here to serve the people, not to serve itself. There is no justification for someone to do and say what Chief Duvall and the city managers of this city did. Let me repeat that. Government exists for the benefit of the people. Government does not exist to look out for itself. Government does not exist to lie in order to get a free toy, that's what they called it in Keene, to get a free toy in order to, what they also said in Keene when they got theirs, a tech. You don't get to do that. There are consequences to those actions, and I hereby once again, as I did at the hearing on the 12th of August, call for the resignation of the people involved. I call for the resignation of Aspel, I call for the resignation of Duval, and I call for the resignation of Debru. Why? Because their names were on that application. And I will tell you, as someone who works for a small arts nonprofit, that when you, as an ordinary citizen, lie on a grant application, you don't get the money, you don't get the tank, you don't get the toy. What you get is in a boatload of trouble. You cannot lie on a grant application that is perjurous, and this should not stand. The questions we should be asking ourselves today is what is domestic terrorism? Because if people are going around defining do domestic terrorism as an idea that they don't like, this country is almost beyond help. It is inexcusable. This country was built on the principles of free speech and being able to have ideas that are counter to someone else's and the big idea was that, hey, government's only role was to protect people from being able to do those things. So to be in a situation where government is saying, well, we don't like your ideas and we feel threatened by you, so we need a tank, is absolutely unconscionable. Chief, actually, Thomas Aspel gave me an amended piece of language at the city council hearing on the 12th. I actually think this wording is almost equally bad, if not worse, so their, their sort of concession to us was, hey, we'll take out your names. Sovereign citizens, free staters, and Occupy New Hampshire, we're not going to call you domestic terrorists anymore because we got caught in a lie, right? What we're going to do now is we're going to call them organizations, and then we're still going to go on and say that these things, we need an uh, armored vehicle for these things. Do you know what they need an armored vehicle for? They need an armored vehicle according to their own language because the state of New Hampshire's experience with terrorism slants primarily towards the domestic type. Now, we have a lot of reporters here. I would like you to go out and find me the examples of domestic terrorism in New Hampshire. 
you know what? Someone at the city council did the research, and the last time there was anything that you could define under terrorism from a private individual was 17 something with the stamp. 65. Yeah, 1765 with the Stamp Act. So, you know, I call on the reporters here to do their duty and to actually go and look at what the facts are. He then goes on to say that due to the location of the state capital of the city of Concord, there are frequent demonstrations by officially organized groups, the for former version, that of course was uh, Free Staters, Sovereign Citizens, and uh, Occupy, which had the potential of growing volatile and present challenges. Now, just to make sure everyone here understands, there is a grant application that went out that first of all called us domestic terrorists. They got caught in that lie, they're backpedaling. So what did they do? They said, well, you know what? We need an armored vehicle to bring to peaceful protests at the State House. Now, last time I looked, in this country, we still had the First Amendment. It's dying, it certainly is. But right now is the time for us to stand up and to say, this will not stand. So I call to the journalists here today the following questions. And if you guys could go do your job, that make my job a little easier because that's how it's supposed to work. If we all do our job, the police chief does his job, there is a valid reason that there are police, their safety are important, but they cannot manifest and make enemies out of peaceful people where it's total nonsense, where it's literally for them to get a free toy where Duval admitted he would not have taken it if he had to go to the taxpayers of New Hampshire or the taxpayers of Concord. He thinks it's free money. It is not free money. The cost of this is going to be extreme. So the questions to you are, can someone find out if they actually amended the grant application? Because no one will talk to me and I think that's an important part. That was something we asked for. The question then is also, procedurally, how does that work? If you amend a grant application after the funds have already been allocated, what would happen to an ordinary person who tried to amend a grant application after it was approved on fraudulent grant grounds? I am very confident that that money would have to be given back, you would have to restart the process, and people would lose their jobs. Why can city officials get away with lying on fraudulent grant applications? And the question is, what should be the repercussions of that? I am calling for their resignation. I think a lot worse things could happen. Generally, when other people create, uh, do fraud, they actually end up in jail. So that should be a question as well. My other question is, why has the chief of police decided to take this matter to the schools of Concord, where, we might like to add, the mayor's wife is on the school board? What does a bearcat have to do with schools? I also am gonna insert a little personal story here. I grew up in South Africa. That was a police state. I grew up under the apartheid regime. I know what police state actions look like because I was in high school in the 80s when the police and the fire department came into my all-girls boarding school and detonated smoke, detect uh, smoke bombs and no one in the school had any idea and it was for the children, it was terrorism preparation. The apartheid regime used terrorism in the way that this government is now using it to reduce our freedoms and to suppress us and to bring us into a tyrannical fa fascist state. I believe that all of the officials involved in the scandal should reside. That should be a voluntary choice they make based on a moral basis for what the world should be. You can't do these kinds of things and not have consequences to it. I have one last thing to say. And that is, I would like to encourage anyone who's watching this to read some books about these issues. These are not just original ideas. These are not things that just free staters think. These are things that people from the left and the right and the middle think. These are things that people think who understand that when you get a disbalance between 
what the government is and what the people are and you have a government that wants to suppress the people for their once again for their ideas then there is a problem so the books i would like you to go read are naomi's naomi wolf's book about the rise of fascism it was published at chelsea green which is up on white river junction go find that book read it she lays out the steps and honeys we're there i would also encourage you to read radley balco's book the rise of the warrior cop he talks about the militarization of the police this sort of corrupt i don't know it's not a potluck it's some kind of awful stew between the federal government and local police where it just is not working and then the third book i would actually encourage people to read is a book that was written about nazi germany and it's called they thought they were free and it's about the ordinary people who are like yeah i don't care right what's that standard joke where they talk about oh first they came for this group and i didn't care because i was in that group and then they came for this group and i didn't care so first they came for the free staters and no one cared because no one likes the free staters volunteer for concord breeds remember that then they came for the sovereign citizens and no one cared and then they came for the occupy and no one cared no one should care because they've been disbanded for a year that's how <laughs> fraudulent his application was so um the book is about just ordinary Germans who were raised and living in Nazi Germany and they were like, yeah, life's pretty peachy, like, oh yeah, there's weird stuff going on, but I don't want to pay attention. I am telling you right now, now is the time to start to pay attention because if you don't, we do not know where this will end. The last thing I would encourage you to read is the New Hampshire Constitution and Article 10. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carla. Next up is State Representative George Lambert. He's here to address accountability in government. Thank you, everyone. I uh, love the opportunity to get out here and talk today about some of my favorite topics. Um, Carla Garrick just grabbed a couple and she ran with them. And she talked about what it was like in, in, in Germany and how people were going, well, it's not my problem. We listened to people showing up here the other day and they said there are more of these vehicles in America today than we had tanks during World War II. So maybe it's not a fair comparison, but I think it is. When Carla says, have you read Article 10 of the New Hampshire Constitution? Well, I had to carry a copy. The last line always inspires me when thinking about what we're going to do about this topic. This is a doctrine of non-resistance against arbitrary power and oppression is absurd, slavish, and destructive to the good and happiness of mankind. What? These are the people who wrote this. This is unmodified from the original New Hampshire Constitution. Why were they concerned about an oppressive government? They had this idea, and that was that government was supposed to be responsive to the people. I enjoy the Pledge of Allegiance a lot, because we talk about the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and then the key words, and to the republic for which it stands. That republic doesn't belong to the administrators, and I'm one of them. I've written grant applications like this, and I've approved them. But the republic is to the people in the community. And what do they think and feel? The people in Concord, when I asked them about this, they said, well, and there aren't enough people from Concord complaining. So the locals around here went out and said, we're going to get some more people involved and start walking around and saying, what do you think, public? And the, when the public says no, it's no. I have the luxury of actually attended, of actually attending police taser training. I actually know what it's like to actually stand on the training, or in the training, and listen to who gets tased and why. I know the procedure, I know what they're supposed to do. Because I was a rep I was a selectman's representative to the police department. And you know what police want? They want to do their job. But they also like the idea of more toys and more militarization because most of them come from the military. They like the tools, they want to be safe. 
being safe requires also accountability to the public that is lost in the dialogue now. We talk so much about safety, we forget that we said in this Constitution, the same one our, that Carla referred to in Article 1, that all government, it says all men, are born equally free and independent. Therefore, all government of right originates from the people, is founded in consent, and instituted for the common good. Can somebody please, in this process, go out and find where the common good comes from when you begin to militarize the local police? The military of the United States of America is not able to behave or be used on American soil. Why is it we as a government have gotten into this behavior that says we're going to militarize our police? The NSA was, uh, there's an article today out, this is the NSA, the National Security Agency, has gone out and lied to the FISA courts on why they're wiretapping young people, why they're wiretapping you, why they're wiretapping people who could potentially be associated with terrorists who are terrorists. They lied. What's the punishment? There is none. What's the punishment for lying on a grant application? There is none. Where is the accountability of the magistrates and officers? I'll tell you where it was written about. It's in the New Hampshire Constitution. Who's doing anything about it? Nobody, because everyone says it's someone else's problem. Well, I'm going to remind you all of one thing today, and that is, I'm coming for that tank. I'm coming, you can call it a Bearcat, you can call it anything you want to, but I'll stand up against it with the most powerful weapon there is in the state of New Hampshire. And it is not a gun, it is not a tank, it is not ammunition, it is the constitution of the state of New Hampshire that says we, as the people, will hold the authorities in charge accountable until the end. And they get to choose it. It's right there. Have a good read. Enjoy it. If you don't know where to find it, take a look online. Go to georgelambert.org. I'll put on a link, and you can read it for yourself. Find out why this document is the most powerful weapon in New Hampshire and the most powerful weapon in the United States. Thank you for your time. Enjoy the read. And remember, if you're not standing up, who's going to listen? Thanks. Thank you. I would like to thank everyone for attending and uh, remind you that those of us who speak are willing to answer any questions. How many signatures did we get? Um, over four, 404 in just a four hour period and also there's an online uh, petition also. A hundred an hour? Uh, what's the URL? Uh, www.nomorebearcats.com Yay! Yes. Ma'am, is the group going to continue to collect petitions until September or was this just a yes. one-off for Saturday? Yes, we are going to continue. Um, the online is there for any t day and I think every I every, actually uh, also have a Saturday. petition at my store during my business hours every if anyone wants to show up and sign that and get pamphlets at the store. Yeah, right. And Saturday we're going to, excuse every me? Every day until the 7th. Every, every day, day until the 7th. But I know on Saturdays we're definitely going to be going door to door. And, um, yes. Or, or what are you going to do with all of the petitions once you're done collecting them? We're going to present them to the city council. No, so so they the can night sort. of the hearing or beforehand? beforehand. Probably yeah. beforehand, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. I like for the cameras to see the difference between the different caliber. It's real nice up close to her. Okay. Uh, Brian? I think that's kind of important. Brian, they, she would like you to show her the, the Well, the well. cameras, please. I, I think that's relatively important to show the absurdity. This is what the chief wants to be protected from, and this is what our military uses on a daily basis to protect themselves with. Actually, I would, I would like to say one thing is this was organized by grassroots people who invited me to come speak. This is not a Free State Project endorsed thing. This is literally people who live in the town saying this is the we want. <laughs> oh! <laughs> I do. She does. Free stater. I came here before them, but free stater. <laughs> no, I know. But I just wanted to make that clear. Before freedom was fashionable. Right. <laughs>
so I mean like literally it's right before the meeting for our only end with the whole thing. I was planning on the next one.